and mentally impaired. And she became conscious in recovery and told her husband word for word what he had prayed. And he couldn't believe it. And he knew at that time that something had happened that there was no accounting for uh, in this world. Did, did you say that he was praying silently? Yes. Uh -huh. And he was in a different location than where she was at, where they were She's working She's in the on. operating room, and he's out in the parking lot. And so what was his reaction when she told him that? He knew that God had spared his wife's life and brought her back. All right. And he knew his prayer had been answered. Okay, physiologically, you just can't do that. You can't hear what somebody's saying out in the parking lot. Dr. Weldon? Yeah, I think, I think part of the problem with the materialistic view is that all the alternate explanations to an actual being outside the body really don't explain the data. Dr. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross, who is one of the leading thanatologists or one of uh, a person who studies death, relates a story of two young boys who were in a car accident. And one of the boys who survived related a story while he was out of the body that he had actually met his brother out of the body and that this brother had in fact died. Uh, he relayed this story to Kubler-Ross afterwards. Now, there's no conceivable way that that boy could have realized that his brother had died unless he had actually met him. Uh, to, to give another illustration, uh, a young woman was in a coma. Uh, during her near-death experience, she uh, accurately described in detail what the doctors did, the resuscitation procedures, the location of various instruments in the uh, hospital room. Uh, several hours later, when the family left, uh, she claimed that her spirit was actually following the uh, vehicle to the home. When they got to the home, she described in detail what happened, what the mother cooked for food that night, uh, the father's de depression and discouragement over the accident that had put her into a coma, the uh, specific toys that her younger brother and sister were playing with, the location of various people in the rooms, and the difficulty with the, the materialistic uh, perspective that, that relegates all of this to something internal is that it really does not adequately explain these kinds of experiences. And by now, there are literally thousands of experiences where people have gone outside of the body and actually seen things that they couldn't even know if they were conscious. Uh, I think that the, um, considered historically, a materialistic viewpoint is, uh, really suffers from a lack of evidence. Most cultures historically, most people throughout human history have believed that there really is another world out there, not just a material world, but a spiritual world also, where God dwells, where angels dwell, and even where demons and devils dwell. All right. Uh, Dr. Rawlings, medically, the fact is I've seen studies where people, in terms of brain waves, when you consider a person who has a flat line in terms of an EEG, the fact is that they're brain dead for uh, up to how long? Three hours? Three hours been recorded by Habermas, but uh, I haven't, uh, we don't routinely take brainwave studies. But the but fact is, is that in that book that you're talking about, Habermas and J.P. Moreland, and they're yeah. two philosophers that basically were skeptical about yes. this and looked at it and actually went and, and categorize these uh, stories That's by right. checking them out. He collaborated, uh, corroborated uh, these, these stories and so on. The fact is, is that if you have a flat uh, uh, brain wave, EEG, the fact is you are not picking up any information, are you? Uh, your brain is not functioning, and it's impossible to have these experiences, but they have them. We had one fellow routinely would put EEGs on when you're getting ready to be a donor. Make sure he's brain dead before you take his parts taking a kidney out, he wakes up, what are you doing? <laughs> he wasn't brain dead, but the EEG was brain dead for a half hour, 30 minutes. Uh, so but the fact is, is that people that have been categorized as brain dead for up to that time, during that time where they've been categorized that way, they are out of their body in another situation, picking up information that it's actually that you can actually check, and they have checked and found out these people were actu accurate in what they this, were seeing uh, and hearing. Kidney case was another one. All right. So the fact is, is that uh, that's one. Then you have the fact of the EKG, where the heart is mm -hmm. actually stopped. This is where your this is your area. How yeah. long can the heart stay stopped? Uh, it's amazing. Uh, Four minutes, we say, but I've seen it 10 minutes. Uh, Kids that have drowned and so on. And longer than that, up to 45 minutes with someone that's drowned, preserved, metabolism is down with cold water, uh, actually recorded. And then they wake up and have this experience, no heartbeat at all. This is all our clinicalness. This is what we're collecting. And the amount of negative cases, and Nancy's running across them, are increasing all the time. They're not all good, the beautiful light 
uh, they call it hell. The others call it heaven. Well, we're, we're going to get to the experiences, and you, you got a point that in some of the cases that you've seen, you would you would warn people it's not safe to die. Right. Okay. But I want to stick with this. Uh, Dave, you've done a lot of study on uh, Eccles, the Nobel Prize winner, in terms of of we are more than just a carcass and uh, a motor in terms of our, our brain up there. Tell us what Eccles found out. Well, of course, he wired the brain and followed the neural activity and uh, would ask a person to do a certain task and a person that could do it, he can follow the neural activity. When they had Parkinson's or they had had a stroke and they were paralyzed, they were not able to do it, something fired in the brain what he called the supplementary motor area, where he believes the spirit makes a connection. But nothing else happened in the brain. In other words, they wanted to do it, they thought of doing it, and the spirit willed the body to do it uh, and made the connection, but then nothing happened. And he describes the brain as, quote, a machine that a ghost can operate. I mean, obviously, uh, psychokinesis is going on right now. I, I mean, I'm not just, I hope I'm not just a piece of educated beefsteak with nerves, you know. <laughs> you, you can't ex explain love or the co moral concepts, physiologically, chemical reactions and, and neural activity in the brain. There's more than that involved. Right. So let me come to you, Nancy. The mm -hmm. fact is, is that a lot of people out there are saying, well, I'm going to die. And these folks are having these experiences that go beyond the physiological state. Would you go as far as say that this is proof that there's life after death? No. Okay. Why? Tell me why. Because in scientific terms, you can't establish proof without a control group. And there's not a whole lot of people repeating this. Nobody's taking the scientists with them on the trip. No. Last time well, we checked. Okay. No. Can I jump in here? Yeah. John? I think Nancy has too high a regard for science because science can't tell you what love is. Science can't tell you why a sunset is beautiful. You see, and science cannot delve into the spiritual realm. If there is more than physiological, if there's a spirit and a soul of man, science has no equipment for evaluating this, okay? I, I think she would agree that there's right. more, but I think the answer of is there proof is what I'm going to. Dr. Weldon? I just think that, that you know, despite the issue of, of uh, you know, the definition of science, which, which can be problematic at times, you know, I think in a broad sense, there is strong suggestive evidence that near-death experiences do provide evidence for a life after death. Yes. Uh, ha Habermas. Suggestive evidence. Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Habermas and, uh, and uh, Moreland, basically on the basis of you have a flat EEG and you have EKG that's flat and, and nothing physiologically is <laughs> happening, and they come back after they've been in that exact time period, and in that exact mm -hmm. time period, tell you what's going on outside the hospital or at another house, or give information about somebody that died in another hospital, you have to say that life continues apart from the physiological processes. Something is going on. So to that extent, Howard? And there's one other piece of evidence. People's lives by the thousands are utterly, radically, totally converted, changed during a moment of extreme trauma and terror. What do you call that? It's irrational to think that they thought that up or they dreamed that up. Something mysterious is happening to people during a crisis. Somebody that puts a gun to his brain and pulls the trigger can be assured of one thing. He stopped the function of the brain cells. That's all. He hasn't ended his life. Well, that, that gets us into this whole thing, and we're going to go in our next program, and I hope you all stick with us, is we're going to go to some of the experiences around this group right here. And the majority of the 11 to 13 million experiences, near-death, clinical death experiences that Gallup cataloged, or actually just uh, through his surveys brought in, uh, the majority of them were what? Good, positive experiences. They yeah. saw the great light and it was a wonderful feeling, okay. okay? But what we're finding out is that you working on patients, you were a skeptic, mm -hmm. and all of a sudden one of your patients blew your mind basically while you were working on We're gonna tell that story. He had a hell experience, and Howard, you're here because the fact is you were a university professor, Northern Kentucky, department head, an atheist, didn't believe in God, and the fact is you had a near-death experience and almost died, and you went to hell. Now the fact is we're going to talk about the good and bad and what these experiences are going to tell us. We'll get that on the table next week. Uh, I hope that you'll join us because next week we're going to take up the topic, is it safe for you to die? Okay, we'll see you next.